This is Revival, Part 4, Revival, Experience, Truth, Preterism, and Defection. Again, this is Part 4, and we are in the book of Isaiah looking at the prophecies of revival. And I just want to continue to remind us that the way that I interpret the word revival is a revival of those who are believers. Now, again, there was an interesting situation at the time of Christ, interesting to say the least, beautiful and interesting, but it involved those who were believers, true believers. And remember, there were false believers and true believers under the Old Testament. Uh, there were those who were trusting in their own self-righteousness for deliverance. And then there were those who trusted that one day, only God alone could deliver them and ransom them from the power of the grave. They knew they were longing for forgiveness of sin, and they were longing for God's presence with them. They trusted solely in him. Okay. But then there were those who were filled with self-righteousness. And when it came time to believe in Jesus, the false believers followed the Pharisees or the Sadducees. But those who were true believers followed Christ. They followed after Christ, okay? So we have looked already at Old Testament, some examples of Old Testament revival, not by any means all of the examples. We also right now are currently looking at the prophecies of revival. Now, the reason why I described revival the way I did is because uh, it is, as, as we consider this next passage in Isaiah chapter 60, it, it, it shows people coming to faith, okay? So maybe we could call that an awakening. Um, we believe that those who come to faith in Christ, well, like all of us, were dead. They were dead, dead in sin, dead in trespasses. And then through faith in Christ, the faith that he alone gives, we, according to Ephesians 2, are made alive together with him. So you might want to make that distinction. So it's not necessarily reviving, but there is a corporate sense, however, of revival that's going on. Uh, you have to remember that all of those Old Testament believers would be revived or resurrected. And the Bible is clear about the timing of that. If you read Hebrews chapters 10 and 11, there's no doubt about it. So you could call that a revival, but also about those Gentiles coming in. Yeah, if you want to describe that as a revival, that's fine. You might think of a tent meeting. Okay, some evangelist comes to town. There's a big tent meeting. He or she preaches the gospel. And now when I say evangelist, you know that I'm not speaking about the miraculous gifting of those in Ephesians chapter 4, but someone who's proclaiming the good news, publishing peace, the glad tidings of salvation, the kingdom of God, the finished work of Jesus. So, People come to faith in Jesus Christ. Would we call that a revival? Might be personal preference. I don't know. For me, I would just call it evangelism and people came to believe in Christ. Praise the Lord. So we're looking at prophesied revival. And then we're going to look at New Testament revival and ultimately, briefly, a revival in church history. So prophesied revival continues as we examine Isaiah 60, and we're recognizing the difference between personal and corporate revival, right? And as I mentioned already, I go through periods of revival every day, every single day. I've gone through them today, right? I've, I've looked at some scriptures and, and I've read them and it's excited me. It's gotten me on fire, but I need that continually. When I stay out of the scripture, when I stay out of fellowship, uh, when I get inward, when I get critical, when I get judgmental, when I get thankless, right? I need a revival. I need a revival. As I mentioned, someone called me out years ago to uh, preach a revival at a church. And the way I looked at it is, okay, let's revive these believers. I am one of these guys who believes that the church, the, the pulpit or whatever, uh, the couch, <laughs> wherever you may be, that is 
when you're when when people are gathered together to study the word of God and they are professing believers in Jesus, hey, you're preaching to the church, you're teaching to the church, you're in fellowship, you're interacting, you're talking about the glory of Jesus, you're excited about Jesus. And throughout that, there are revivals going on in people's hearts. And when when I say revival, I am not at all talking about some sort of a charismata or any kind of physical demonstrations, though it might manifest itself that way. I know for a fact that, man, I get revived when I'm singing worship, whether it's hymns or a beautiful praise and worship song. And some of the lyrics just really stir my soul and remind me of the glory and finished work of Jesus. Man, I'll raise my hands. I'll I'll say amen. I'll say glory to God. I'll say hallelujah. And we all do that or at least should. I mean, if, if, if we're excited about something, God forbid that we should hold it in. Look at David, you know, dancing before the Lord, dancing with all his might. See my last message, uh, on that. It's called, I think it's called, uh, the favorite worship style of Jesus. I, I hope you would check it out. I, uh, I think it was a good message. (laughs) All right. So yeah, I recognize the difference between personal and corporate revival. So uh, for our purposes right now, we're going to focus on, we are continuing to focus on corporate revival. So corporate messianic revival as prophesied in the Old Testament pertains to the New Testament. There are no prophecies whatsoever of the messianic appearance that are different from the blessings that the appearance of Emmanuel would bring. None. Okay? Now, do they continue? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's only shallow. It's it's just complete, superficial, shallow, and uh, ignorant teaching that says that everything ceased in the first century. That's just shallow. And it, it, it blows my mind how some of these intellectual preterists Uh, have gravitated toward that idea. Um, That's not the gospel, and I would just run from that as quickly as you can. But we are dealing with an ever-increasing government, Isaiah 9, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. All right, let's look at Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 22. As I mentioned in the last study, this is the quintessential revival passage, and also we could say evangelical passage. I think it's just both. It's it's incredible. Watch watch what we see here. Okay. And I and I'm just gonna comment. I'm gonna make some brief comments about some of the metaphor, uh the 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 kingdom blessings, kingdom elements here, messianic elements. Of course we know Jesus is the light of the world. He is our light, he is our glory, we've been glorified. Please see my my series on uh, it's called You Are Already Glorified. All right, here it is. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Jesus. Light has come. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So he's talking to Israel. So he's saying the glory of the Lord has risen like the sunrise. That's that's what the word implies there, the sunrise. For darkness shall cover the land and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will appear over you. And I've shown in other studies how that glory is shown. What did Jesus say? Let your light so shine, right? Let your light shine. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. You are the light of the world. He's saying, I am the glory. You are the glory, right? He's not saying we're God. He's saying that that glory, that love and mercy that we show one another that Christ has shown us, that is the demonstration of light. They will know, they're looking from the outside, they will know you are my disciples. How? By your love. What is that love? Love covers a multitude of sins. When they see us biting and devouring one another, that's Pharisaic. When they hear us gossiping, judging, elevating ourselves, that's Pharisaic. Jesus said they will know you're my disciples by your love. So there's that initial group of first century Israelites coming to faith in Jesus. And then the Gentiles see it. And we see that in the book of Acts. The Gentiles see this and they believe in Christ. You see that especially in passages like Acts chapter 13 and 15. So arise, shine, the glory of the Lord is risen. Darkness covers the earth, thick darkness, but the Lord will arise upon you, right? And they were at that time, they were waiting for the day star to arise in their hearts. See that in second Peter. 
So the Gentiles are going to see this and his glory will appear over you nations. There it is. Isn't that beautiful? Ethnos um, or Goyim, Hebrew. Nations shall come to your light, right? In other words, they see Jesus on us and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Please compare all of this with Revelation 21 and 22. Lift up your eyes. Look around. They all gather together. That's what was going on in the book of Acts and continues. They come to you. Your son shall come from far away. In other words, this is the family of God, right? Ephesians chapter 3 says the Gentiles would be fellow heirs and partakers of the promise in Christ. How? By the gospel, the good news. So they come from far away and your daughters shall be carried on nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. More of that light theme. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice. Why? Because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. Or as I believe the King James says, the abundance of the sea shall be converted to you. Which is interesting because Jesus said to Peter, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Okay, so there's, you know, there's that sense. Peter was a believer, but he still needed to be converted. That was be born again, Pentecost. That's the beginning of the flowing of rivers of living water. And then the Gentiles would see this and you see this going on again, Acts 13 and 15. The abundance of the seas, he represents the Gentiles, shall be brought to you the wealth of the nations. Again, compare this, Revelation 21 and 22. The wealth of the nations, Uh, shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold. Of course, this kind of reminds us of, remember the queen of Sheba coming, that she had heard the fame of Solomon, whose name represents peace. Well, what's Christ called? He's called our peace. Ephesians chapter two, he is our peace. And so she hears of this and then she comes to it and then she says, wow, I'd heard of your fame, your glory. The half had not been told. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? In other words, this is corporate, corporate before it's just little individual strangers here and there, foreigners or aliens as they call them, right? But this is uh, uh, just vast multitudes all the flocks of Kedar should be gathered to you. The rams of Nebiah shall minister to you. Isn't that beautiful? In other words, God is saying, man, the, the Gentiles will minister to you Israelites. They shall be acceptable upon my altar. Isn't that interesting? What did Paul say in Isaiah chapter, I believe it's chapter 66. Uh, Paul, well, Isaiah wrote it, prophesied of it. Uh, they shall take of the nations Levites, right? It's just, uh, uh, just a, a term. It's not really that they were Levites, but he was taking of them to be Levites. He's made us all a royal priesthood, Isaiah 61 and 62. And it says, they shall be acceptable upon my altar. And Paul says in Romans 15, that this was fulfilled by him bringing the Gentiles as an offering to the Lord. I just think that that is magnificent. And I will glorify the house of my glory or my glorious house. What's that? That's the church. We are glorified. Romans 8, 29, 30, 31 and following. I will glorify my glorious house. This is the church. What did Jesus pray? He says, the glory that you have given me, I have given them so that they may be one. And what does Paul say? We are one in Christ. No more Jew or Gentile. Who are these that fly like a cloud and like doves to their roosts or windows? For the coastland shall wait on me. Again, Gentiles, the ships of Tarshish first to bring your children from far away, their silver and gold with them for the name of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel. Why? Why were they coming? Because he has glorified you. Do you see that? That glorification had to take place first. The Gentiles had to see the light of Jesus on that first century uh, Israelite church. They saw them because he has glorified you. What did they see? Your love for one another. They will know you're my disciples. 
Foreigners, there it is. Foreigners shall build up your walls. Walls represents defense. We come to each other's aid, defense. We bring the cross to one another. When we fail, we bring the cross. We don't kick them when they're down. When they're down, we give them the cross. And the world sees that and they say, man, I want that. I want to go to that house. I want to be a part of that house. They're forgiving, they're loving, they're gracious, they're merciful. Oh, what did Jesus say? I desire mercy. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The Pharisees all consumed with sacrifice. Foreigners shall build up your walls. We are a defense one, uh, to one for another. And their king shall minister to you. For in my wrath, I struck you down. But in my favor, I have had mercy on you. The favor of the cross, the favor of forgiveness, the, for, the favor of being washed white as snow, the favor of God saying, their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. Can I get a hallelujah? All right. But in my favor, I've had mercy on you. Your gates shall always be open. That is almost identical language to Revelation. Chapters 20, 21 and 22, which says the gates are always open so that kings may be brought in. They're never shut. It continually is happening. People are continually through faith in Christ entering the gates of the city. Your gates shall always be open day and night. They shall not be shut. Why? So that nations shall bring you their wealth with their kings led in procession for the nation and kingdom that will not serve you will perish. That abolishes the idea of universalism, okay? Because he recognizes there are some that will not come to faith in Christ. They won't. Faith is a gift and it is given to those whom God pleases. We don't know who they are. We simply tell the gospel and we live out the gospel and the mercy of Jesus. Those nations shall be utterly laid waste. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the plain, and the pine to beautify the place of my sanctuary. That's just like the language in Isaiah. Uh, I believe it's 61. Uh, and 62, it talks about us being trees. We see that again, as we just saw before in Isaiah 55. And to what? Beautify the place of my sanctuary. That's the church, the house of God. He plants all these trees in this house. That's what he's saying. I will glorify the house of my glory. glory. I plant the trees. We don't. God did. And I will glorify where my feet rest. Isn't that wonderful? We see that where my feet rest. Where do you get that idea? Psalm 132, where he says, he describes us, he describes Zion. He says, this is my uh, chosen place of habitation. Here will I rest. Zephaniah, the Lord will rest in his love. That's us. Can you imagine? We are God's Sabbath. We are the resting place. At six days of creation. And then on the seventh, the Lord rested. Christ, because of Christ, who is our Sabbath, he has made us his Sabbath rest. Isn't that beautiful? I think so. The descendants of those who oppressed you. So now he appeals to their knowledge of history and the Gentiles taking them captive, exile, Assyria, Babylon, and so forth. The descendants of those who oppressed you shall come bending low. Well, under the Old Testament, they would look at this and say, see, we're going to have dominion. We're going to rule over those Gentiles. Oh, yes, they did by the gospel that's how they triumph. The gospel, it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew and to the Greek, the Gentile. The descendants of those who oppressed you shall come bending low and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. You see, the Pharisees kept insisting this is going to be physical dominion over Rome. And Paul is insisting, no, that is the spiritual dominion over the gospel of the hearts of the Gentiles. This is fantastic. And it's only supernatural. They shall call you the city of the Lord. What did Jesus say? You are a city set up on a hill. Let your light so shine. So the Gentiles saw that light. And what do we see? That's the city in Revelation 20 and 21, whose gates are always open. And the nations believe and enter into that city. And they become just as much a part of that city as those first century Israelites and Jews, right? They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 21. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. He says, to an innumerable company of angels, to the spirits of just men made perfect. And he says, and to God, the judge of all, and to the, the blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. To Jesus, 
the mediator of the new covenant. And he says to the church of the firstborn, the general assembly, we're all a part of it. It's beautiful. Whereas you've been forsaken and hated with no one passing through, I will make you a, make you majestic forever, a joy from age to age that keeps going. Maybe a, a an allusion to, or a prophecy looking forward to Ephesians 3, 21, to him be glory in the church. What? Age without end. You shall suck the milk of nations. You shall suck the breast of kings. It's a big family relationship having nothing to do with biology, DNA, or genealogy to Abraham or David. Just say no to Zionism and Christian Zionism. It's false. It's heresy. Don't buy into that. You shall suck the milk of nations, suck the breast of kings. You shall know that I, the Lord, am your what? Savior. That's Jesus. He's our Savior and your Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. This is all at the same time frame. Instead of the bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I'll bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will appoint peace as your overseer. That's Jesus. Jesus is our overseer, the bishop and shepherd, the overseer of your souls. Peter says that. And righteousness as your taskmaster, the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 23. Uh, Behold, I raise unto David a righteous branch. In his days, Judas shall uh, be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name he, by which he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness, Yahweh Tzidkenu. And that's all Paul is preaching in Romans chapters three and four. The Lord is our righteousness, not our works. And that goes hand in hand with Isaiah 54 verse 17. Their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Okay, that's Jesus. We have the righteousness of Christ. Second Corinthians 5, 21. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Hey, you see that? You see that in, in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse one. Comfort my people, comfort. A prophecy, John the Baptist, same time frame, Jesus. Cry unto her that what? Her warfare is over and her iniquity is pardoned. And he's made of the two one so that we no longer learn war anymore, nor do we lift up sword. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. It's all about fruit now, the fruit of love and mercy and the righteousness of Jesus. There's no more war. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Devastation or destruction, no more within your borders. Why? This is a city of peace, the peace of Jesus. He is our peace who's broken down the middle wall of partition and made of the two, Jew and Gentile, one new person, one new man. You shall call your wall salvation. We build up those walls. He just said it earlier. We comprise those walls. Defense. We protect one another. We protect each other from gossip. We protect each other from evil tongues that would speak uh, horrible, ungracious accusations against us. Who is he that condemns, right? God has justified you. Who shall lay a charge? We're protected. Wall salvation, your gates, praise. Wow. What is that saying? Your walls, your salvation is praise. The more we praise, the more we thank God, that proves our defense, our protection by the blood of Jesus. The sun shall no longer be your light. Why? Jesus is our light. By day nor uh, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you by night, but the Lord will be your everlasting light. Again, Jesus, I am the light of the world and your God will be your glory. Again, John 17, the glory you have given me, I have given them. If Jesus dwells in us, we have his glory. We've been glorified. We're covered with robes of righteousness. Your sun will no more go down. I should say, the word of God teaches us that the sun, S-U-N of righteousness, will come with healing in his wings. And that is we've been healed from sin sickness. We are alive in Christ. That's why Peter quoted Isaiah 53 and he says, with his stripes, we are healed. Your sun shall no more go down or your moon withdraw itself for the Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of mourning shall be ended. Again, right along with Isaiah chapter 61. You read it, it's the same thing. The spirit of the Lord is is upon me. He's sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up uh, the brokenhearted and and to turn, you know, uh, ashes into beauty, to give you the oil of joy for mourning, right? 
the, your days of mourning shall be ended. Jesus said that's fulfilled. Jesus quoted Isaiah 61, said it's fulfilled. Your people shall all be righteous. All the people of God are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we would be the righteousness of God. Man, I'm so excited. They shall possess the land forever. The land, that's the church. We're in Christ. Old Testament in the land, New Testament in Christ. We're safe and saved and secure. They are the shoot that I planted, the work of my hands. This has nothing to do with our righteousness, our power, our ability, our will, our decision. This was God's decision. They are the shoot that I planted, the work of my hands. Why? So that I might be glorified. The least of them shall become a clan and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, I will accomplish it quickly. And he did a short work in righteousness will he perform on the earth. Oh, wow, man. I hope you got as excited as I just did. If not, I'm sorry. <laughs> but this is just so beautiful to me. And, and I really do hope you were blessed and edified. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, NCMI Live. And again, if you were blessed, support us at patreon.com forward slash NCMI Live. Or you may send a check to G. Ward Finley, P.O. Box 1017, Colfax, California, 95713. I love you guys. I thank you so much. And uh, this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. So, yeah, I apologize for getting a little overtaken with joy. But, man, when I meditate on this stuff, it's just... It, it's just uh, reviving. <laughs> Talk about revival. Amen. God bless you.